Right, please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. I'm sure you've heard this phrase before, but you can help me finish it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Absolutely. It's amazing how true this is. It's a very human thing in some ways uh, to maybe protect ourselves. Um, if we sense that someone doesn't care about us, then we don't trust them. We don't easily believe them. Maybe we aren't hurt as much by them because we're guarded. I don't care what they think because they don't care about me. Well, last week, we looked at these statistics in our nation, how more and more people are choosing not to care about faith in God. At least 26% or one in four people today in our country have no religious affiliation. The uh, pollsters have a name for them. Do you remember what it is? The nuns, okay? N-O-N-E-S. Only... 4%, though, are atheists, which means 21% of our population might believe in some kind of God, but they don't really care. Now, I think it's probably actually higher than that. People who believe in God, but it doesn't really make a difference in their lives. Well, maybe... They don't care about God because they don't know how much God cares for them. You know, we just sang about God's amazing grace. Grace is evidence that God cares. So grace, one definition of it is undeserved favor. It's unmerited favor. This is, grace is not something you can earn. Uh, grace is doing something kind or beneficial, or giving a valuable gift, or a privilege to someone who doesn't deserve it. Now, if someone shows you grace, you have good reason to believe that person cares for you, or cares about you. Uh, parents, we do this for our children all the time. There are times when our children do bad things, right? They disobey, they sin. And there are consequences for that, but there are times as parents when we show grace. They don't deserve it, but we bless them. Now, why would we do that? Because we want our kids to know we care. We love them. We do not love their sin, but we love them in spite of their sin. And so we show grace sometimes because we want to build trust. We want to build that relationship. We don't do it all the time, but there are times when we do. We show grace. God does this with us. Okay, The centurion last week in Luke 7, he said, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Chapter 7, verse 6. Well, that's an honest assessment of his life compared to a holy God. Good self-awareness. <laughs> compared to a holy God, I am not worthy. But God shows grace. And he does it to everyone. Somebody asked me about this recently. And there are at least two big categories of grace. The first we will call common grace. All right? This is God's kindness to everyone everyone, regardless of faith. Did you know that God shows grace to everyone, whether they believe, whether they know about him or not? Well, there's some evidence of that. Look at Matthew 5. We'll put it on the screen. Jesus says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. You see, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's grace. God doesn't discriminate in that. He sends those good things to both. Similar passage in Luke 6 that we saw a few weeks ago. 
Jesus says, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid, then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Why should we do that to evil people, to our enemies? It says, for he, our God, is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. He shows grace. It's common grace there. And then Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for us because we loved him and were calling out to him. He, he did that for us while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners. Common grace. But then there is special grace, right? Special grace is God's kindness to those who have faith, still undeserved, it's still available to all, but it's only applied when we believe. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So in our text today, Jesus is going to perform another healing. But more than that, he performs a, the miracle of raising someone from the dead. Okay, now that's new in our story here in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus hasn't done that yet. Last week, the centurion exhibited a faith that even caused Jesus to be amazed. But today, Jesus does this miracle without anyone asking. There is no evidence of a specific faith that caused Jesus to do it. It's just grace. It's undeserved. No one is worthy of this. So why would Jesus do this? Because he cares. Jesus cares. See, our world needs to know this. God's love and kindness and care. It's not just a transaction or a benefit for those who believe. Well, you give me this, I'll give you that. Okay, we'll trade. No. God is kind to the wicked. If the world knew how much God cares for them, how much he loves them, how much he has done for them, well, maybe they would care more about knowing him. So this is our big idea for today. Knowing God cares helps us care to know God. Knowing the fact that God actually cares about us, maybe it lowers the walls, the defenses, to say, you know, I, I want to get to know this God who cares so much about me. John 3.16, God so loved the world, a fallen world that was in sin, a world full of people who were enemies of God. He so loved this world, this common grace, that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him, the special grace, should not perish but have eternal life. See, God's love and his grace are offered to everyone but not all receive it. We saw that two weeks ago, two thieves hanging on the cross. One humbled himself and received God's grace. The other dug his heels in. Jesus loves our world. Jesus loves your neighbor, even that one you don't particularly like, right? So we all need this reminder today that Jesus cares. Let's pray as we dive in. God, thank you uh, for, for grace. Thank you that you choose to love us even when we don't love you. Uh, you choose to do good. Um, so much of what we experienced even this morning, waking up, coming here, was because of your grace. So God, open our eyes to see how much you care I pray that you would draw us closer to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, so Jesus cares about a world in need. And the first thing we see in our story today, Jesus cares when we experience loss. Uh, Look at Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 12. Okay, so this was after he healed the centurion's servant in Capernaum. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. All right, so it might be fair to ask here, if if God cared so much about this poor widow, why didn't he come earlier? Before he died. I mean, that's the same almost same situation that was true for Martha and Mary when their brother Lazarus died. If you remember that story, Jesus waited a few days after he heard Lazarus was sick. And by the time he got there, Lazarus was dead. Even his sisters questioned, why did Jesus wait? In John 11, 21, it says this, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had not waited, if you would have just come, we could have avoided this whole crisis, Jesus. But remember from last week, God uses these crises in our lives to get our attention, to open our eyes to new ideas, to cause us to lean into our community, to depend on others. God wants us to find the way to real life. But there's only one way to that life, and it's through Jesus. And sometimes, sometimes we need a loss, a crisis, something to wake us up. Doesn't mean God caused the crisis. Life in a fallen world provides plenty of, of crises, but by his grace, if we will look to him in faith, he can use that crisis to help us find our way to eternal life and life today. This is how we can understand this great promise we read about in Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Okay, so when these these crises come, doesn't mean all things are good, but crises are part of the all things that God uses in our lives when we experience loss to produce something good. Why does he do that? Because he cares. And Luke wants you to be certain about this, and he wants you to to know this about Jesus. First, Jesus knows where he is going. If you look in our story After the centurion's servant is healed in verse 10, Luke says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. All right, so I want to show you where this is on a map. You'll see this kind of has most of Israel on there. And so far in Luke, he's been pretty much up at the top of the map there in that area called Galilee. And you see Capernaum is the town on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's where he was in verse 10. But then it says he goes to this town called Nain. This is the only reference to this town in the Bible uh, because it's a small town. There's nothing there. Even today, it's a small Arab village with about 200 people. And there's no evidence, archaeologically or otherwise, that this town was ever any bigger than that. It's about 25 miles from Capernaum, and you can't tell from this map, but it's mostly uphill. Okay, this was not an easy journey. I'm sure the disciples, you know, who had been kind of freshly called to to accompany Jesus, kept asking him, so where are we going, Jesus? (laughs) Uh, We're getting a long way from home, Jesus. Uh, You know there's no Chick-fil-A's up here, right, Jesus? Uh, I don't even think there's any hotels up here. And look at all these people. 
that are with us, Jesus? Are we lost? Well, Luke says there was a great crowd following him from Capernaum. Now, this would be like a whole bunch of us walking together. I said, hey guys, we're going to go on a little journey. And we just start walking from Naples to Immokalee. Right? Can you imagine the questions that are being asked after a few miles? <sighs> this better be good. <laughs> um, but this is not a random hike. Jesus knows exactly where he is going, and he knows the exact moment that he is supposed to arrive because Jesus knows why he is going. This is not a coincidence that he arrives the very moment this funeral procession is coming out of town. So first, Jesus knows where he is going. The second, he knows why he is going. There's these two crowds. Okay, Jesus uh, is coming, and he's got this great crowd. They're kind of wondering, all right, what's Jesus going to do next? We've come a long way for this. And they meet a considerable crowd coming out of the town who are grieving. Is this a coincidence? No. Uh, how many times in our lives do we call something a coincidence? When what's really happening is God is at work in your life. He is at work in others' lives. And he causes us to bump into each other at just the right time. What a coincidence. No. <laughs> Jesus knows where he's going. He knows why he is going. He knew exactly what time to leave Capernaum so he could arrive just as the funeral procession was coming out. He led them on this entire inconvenient journey, really, because he knows, third thing, who he is going to help. A man had died. He was the only son of a woman who was already a widow. No one called Jesus. There's no evidence they sent a messenger to Jesus to ask for help. It doesn't even say that they were praying to God for a miracle. Like I said earlier, there's no evidence of faith here. It is simply that Jesus cares. He knows there's a woman in great need, a widow with no sons, was in a dangerous position with no way to provide for herself. It's an act of grace. God sees what you're going through. He cares when we experience loss. I mean, tragic and terrible things happen all the time in a fallen world. We see it every day on the news. This week was no exception. More shootings, more death, more tragedy. Every week, it seems like. Now, some people, when they see this, when they see all this tragedy and all this trauma and all this violence going on around us to innocent people, they see it as evidence that God doesn't care, right? Why would God allow that? Well, these are big questions. The answers are not easy to understand, especially if you have a deficient view of God and an insufficient view of sin. I mean, science, physics, astronomy, they all tell us the very fact that our earth doesn't just fly off into the universe and all life disappears. That's evidence of God's common grace. There's no explanation. The universe should just be flying apart, but here we are. The fact that we can breathe, the fact that we can sleep, the fact that we can set our alarm and expect the sun to come up, this is evidence of God's common grace. We don't even know how many times in a day God saves our lives from tragedy. But we don't deserve it. It's grace. The very fact that we are here, the fact that we are alive, 
is evidence that God does care. But he uses crises. He allows them to accomplish even greater acts of kindness and grace. It's what we see happening here. Jesus, his crowd of followers arrive at the right time. And then what happens? Uh, Jesus cares enough to show compassion. It's the second thing. And let's look at that in verse, starting in verse 13 to 15. So these two crowds are coming together outside the town in verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, the widow, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. So my Bible is an English Standard Version, ESV, and it says Jesus had compassion. Uh, other versions say his heart went out to her. His heart overflowed with compassion. Others say his heart broke for her. It's pretty powerful. Jesus is showing great emotion here. Even when Lazarus died and his sister Mary cried to Jesus, do you remember what Jesus did with her? He wept. He knew he would raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet he wept with her. See, Jesus, he cares, and he cares enough to show compassion And three things that we see. Jesus knows first what to say. Uh, Jesus walks right up to the funeral procession to this mother who is grieving. And then he speaks to the mother and he says, do not weep. Now that's, that's not what they taught me to do in my pastoral counseling classes. All right. When someone is grieving, what do we usually say? It's okay to cry. Well, maybe she knew who Jesus was. You know, Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, was only five miles away. Maybe he built her some cabinets or a nice rocking chair uh, when he was the local carpenter. We don't know if there was a relationship or a knowledge of who Jesus was at the time. But remember, Jesus is the only way to life. And if Jesus says, do not weep, He knows what he is saying. He was showing compassion by coming to her and saying this. It's not that he was uncomfortable with crying. You know, I'm just not into crying. Please don't weep. I don't think that's what it was. He came to give her hope. Do not weep. This is basically what he told Martha when Lazarus died in John 11. Going back to that story, Jesus said to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I can't say that to people when they're grieving because I'm not the resurrection and life, but Jesus is. But Jesus does more than speak to her. Jesus knows, secondly, what to do. And he does something very unexpected for a Jewish rabbi. He touches the the coffin or the beer or the the platform that was carrying the dead man. That would make him unclean by Jewish religious standards. But he touches it and then he speaks to the dead man. Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sits up, and he begins to speak. Can you imagine the shock? I mean, the surprise, not just to the people and to the mother. How do you think the guy felt? What's going on? Now, is anyone surprised that God has the power to raise people from the dead? No. Um, We shouldn't be surprised at that. I think the bigger question here is, 
Why doesn't he do this all the time? You know, Jesus could spend all his time chasing down funeral processions to raise the dead. Oh, there's another one. There's another one. He doesn't do that. He did it here because he cares. No one asked him to do this, but his heart broke for this woman. He had compassion. And then it says, Jesus knows how to comfort. It says, Jesus gave the man to his mother. That must have been an amazing moment, don't you think? But it was only a temporary solution, right? Just like Lazarus, this man would die again. You see, Jesus came to do something far greater, something that would last forever. This was grace that he did this for this family. Um, he didn't require anything from them. But there was a response from all of those who saw this happen. And the response actually matters if we want to experience that greater miracle of salvation and eternal life. So third thing we see in our text, Jesus cares that we respond in faith. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. After Jesus gave the, the, the young man to his mother, fear seized them all. And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us. God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Well, I imagine this uh, great crowd that had followed him 25 miles from Capernaum to this little village all the way uphill in Nain. They were not disappointed. When the young man sat up and was raised from the dead, they were like, yes, we knew it was going to be good. And the disciples, I imagine, were pretty glad because I think the crowd was asking a lot of questions. They didn't have any answers. Where are we going? You know, Matthew, where are we going? Where is Jesus leading us? And they're like, we don't know. But then they get this incredible display of God's compassion, his power, his care. This was undeserved kindness, grace on full display. And what we see about God's kindness, three things. First thing is it leads us to worship. Fear sees them all. They glorified God. Now, I like how the message puts this. It's another translation. It's kind of a paraphrase. But in Luke 7, 16, this is what the message says. They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery. What just happened? God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful. And then they were noisily grateful. See, fear of God is, is this awe. It's this reverence and mystery and respect. What, what's happening? What's going on? They knew God was at work among them. And so they worshiped. They praised God. They glorified God. God's kindness to this woman and her son was unsolicited. It was grace. But when God's kindness is shown, Jesus cares about our response because our response indicates our heart and what's going on in here. Do we turn to him in worship or do we just keep going our own way? Romans chapter 2 talks about God's kindness. And I first want to read it in the ESV. That's the translation I use here. It says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Okay, do you presume on that, not knowing that when God shows his kindness to you, it's meant to lead us to repentance? 
Here it is in the New Living Translation. I just want you to feel what's happening here. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? That's the presumption. Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's designed to show you that he cares, that he loves you, he wants a relationship with you. But how you respond to that matters. When you see God's grace in your life, whether it's an act of a miraculous intervention or, or simply the fact that you woke up today, the sun rose, you made some plans for your day, and you could. Um, this, this grace, even just that kindness, should lead us to worship. Now, presumption is confidence in me. It's confidence that, you know, I kind of deserve this. Presumption says, well, it's my right. Um, be very careful about presuming on God's kindness and his patience. Um, because a day is coming when God's kindness and his grace will not be available anymore. Um, this is Romans 2.4. Let's just look at the next verse, Romans 2.5. But because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. I mean, do you hear the warning? Don't, when God shows his kindness to you and his grace, don't, don't take it for granted. How are you going to respond when you realize how, how much God has done for you, how much he's reached out for you? Don't harden your heart. Don't be stubborn. Don't refuse to turn from your sin. Jesus cares for you. And he cares about your response to his kindness and grace. How you respond matters. So it leads us to worship. The second thing God's kindness leads us to is to have hope. So the crowds cheered and you see what they shouted there. A great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. So you have to know kind of the bigger Bible story here. Very Not far from this village of Nain, um, over 500 years earlier, there was a prophet by the name of Elijah. And he performed a miracle of raising the son of a widow from the dead. It was in the town of Zarephath, the widow of Zarephath. And it was very nearby. And all of these people, if they knew their Bibles, which they probably grew up hearing, they knew about this story. It was a time of, of great fear famine, and the widow was caring for Elijah, and he fed him. You remember the, the jug of oil, the jar of flour that didn't run out. He was faithful. She took care of Elijah, but then her son dies. We read this in 1 Kings 17, verses 20 to 23. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? I mean, Elijah was like, God, why would you do this? Why would you allow this? And he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. Well, the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. And it sounds a little bit like Luke 7. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house, and he gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. So these people knew this story, but it had been hundreds of years since they had heard from God. God's kindness, if, if we'll open our eyes, 
and we can see it all around us, it can actually give us hope that God cares. He's working among us. A response of faith leads us to worship. It gives us hope. And then look at what happens next. God kind, God's kindness leads us to spread good news. Verse 17. This report about Jesus spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. See, if you see God's kindness and grace displayed in your life and in those around you, here's what you should do. Call it out. Tell others. This is really good news. We live in a world that is desperate for good news. It's desperate for hope. Jesus cares about everyone. Even that lost neighbor of yours that you don't like very much. And if our lost world could begin to understand how much God loves them, how much he has done for them. If they knew how much Jesus cared for them, perhaps they might care to know God. You see, God doesn't want anyone to perish. The Bible tells us this, 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise about coming again and, and bringing justice and, and life and, and, and the future and heaven. He's not slow. Why isn't he coming? No, he's not slow. As some counts or understand slowness. Instead, he's being patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That's why he's waiting. See, God has taken the initiative He's shown common grace. He's shown his kindness to all by dying for our sins while we were still sinners. But don't presume on that kindness. Don't refuse his generous offer. Jesus cares that we respond in faith, that we receive the gift of eternal life, this special grace which begins right now. And then once we've received that, once we've seen it, it should lead us to worship, to live with hope, to spread the good news that Jesus cares for a world in need. Is that good news? Absolutely is. Amen. Well, let's pray. God, forgive us for our presumption, just taking for granted, seeing and knowing. Some of us have heard these stories. We've, we've known you for so long, God, that we begin to take for granted all that you have done for us that we don't deserve. Somehow we begin to presume and think, well, this is our right or that we're good enough. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for presuming that somehow we have a right to live, a right to breathe. We don't, God. We're not worthy. You hold creation together. You are holy. You are great. Thank you, God, that you have made a way through Jesus. Thank you for caring so much for us. We want to know you. We want to worship you. We want to give you praise. Because you are great.